So what I'm saying is that we only flourish on this planet because of the circular metabolism, because of life cycling everything it needs. So we've got to be concerned with that process. If we've got any sense of self-preservation and survival, we are looking at the world through the wrong eyes or with the wrong worldview anyway, because we've grown up in a culture that has been telling itself that the world and the universe is a big clockwork machine where the response you get is kind of proportional to the input you give it. <laughs> that, I believe, is basically a delusion. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast, a bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. Today, we will talk about an essential concept to understand our ecological crisis, tipping points. In fact, several climate tipping points, including ice loss both in Greenland and Antarctica, the slowdown of the Atlantic circulation and more, are dangerously close and risk triggering a tipping cascade. To understand these risks and how to keep us in a safe space through positive tipping points, I have the great pleasure to welcome Professor Tim Lenton. Tim is Chair in Climate Change and Earth System Science at the University of Exeter. And this discussion will cover how to understand Earth as a system, the different types of feedback loops and cycles, the different types of tipping points from ecological ones to socio-ecological ones, as well as early warning signals for climate and socio-ecological tipping points. So with all that being said, Tim, thanks so much for being here and welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for bringing me onto the podcast, Steve. That's great. Yes, th there is this topic of tipping points, which I... I'm so excited to discuss. Of course, you have just written or edited a, a major report on this and you have uh, published many articles on this. Before we get to tipping points, I think we, we just need a, a short introduction perhaps of how did you get into biogeochemistry, modeling, understanding that the Earth has a system? I mean, w what was a bit your, your passion with this? Because this is, has turned into your career, right? I was a 18-year-old uh, kid who'd um, gone up to Cambridge University to study the natural sciences because I was passionate about science, um, read avidly as a teenager. I was a bit disillusioned with my degree, if I'm honest. Um, but I, after a term at university, my dad gave me Jim Lovelock's books on Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth. Um, and I was captivated by that. And I it was just like my calling. I thought, yeah, that's what I want to research. So I uh, I wrote to Jim and said, um, look, I'd love to research this and study this and help you out um, when I graduate. And he wrote back saying, great, come and visit and have a chat. <laughs> and uh, it sort of started from there, really. Yeah, so I was very lucky. I was 19 when I met my kind of scientific mentor, if you like, Jim Ludlock, and I was... When I graduated my degree, I went straight into my PhD studies, trying to work on Gaia, as he called it, understand how life is involved in regulating the cycling and the concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus in the ocean and oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, and um, it's just gone on from there, really. I've always been passionate about trying to understand the Earth as a, a living system and then kind of explain that new scientific worldview to to my students or to anybody else who's interested because uh, it's like a worldview. We desperately need that shift in worldview now. Yeah, I mean, it's a long journey always, but if you study how life has transformed the planet in the past and how the Earth has gone through the occasional tumultuous change that actually got us to where we are now, interspersing long periods of kind of relative stability and calmness, then you kind of appreciate that when we evolve and uh, the way we have and we start hitting the Earth system hard um, with our greenhouse gas emissions and all the rest of it, then you have a keen sense already, well, I know the Earth is, and bits of the Earth and the climate have tipped in the past. Um, it seems intuitive that we could tip them again now, so I better start studying that. <laughs> so that's what I was doing um, by the, you know, about the late 1990s onwards. Really, I suddenly thought, mm, but I really must have a careful look at that. Um, yeah. 
I think it's fascinating. You you already used some terms. I think that we might need to to define a bit better. So you talked about circulation of flows. You talked about nitrogen. You talked about the Earth as a system. I think when we talk about tipping points, there is a certain grammar or vocabulary or jargon that we need to define for the listeners or the viewers. So, for instance, um, when we talk about the system, we have to define this system, right, that we're studying. Uh, we define it both in spatial scope, temporal scope. Uh, we define what are the feedback loops, what are the flows that we're studying within this massive system, especially when it's Earth, right? So perhaps can you help us by a small example, explain us what, what is this Earth system, right? What, what do we study when we look at Earth as a system? Well, we study the thin film of life and uh, and the gas envelope of the atmosphere and the liquid envelope of the ocean and the, the organic matter of the soils um, and maybe the very top of the crust of the Earth. But the, the realm that some would call the biosphere as well, which is the realm that supports life. And in to my definition, that that is the Earth system of Earth system science. There's another Earth underneath that that's powered by um, the heat of internal radioactive decay and also the heat that's still left over from when the Earth was formed when it smashed together as um, bits of rock colliding under gravity. And that heat is what drives the the mental circulation and so on and so forth. But that's like, those are like, in my eyes, two systems. And it's the surface Earth system, if we want to call it that, um, bounded at the top by outer space and with a slightly fuzzy inner boundary somewhere, depending on the time scale, somewhere between the Earth's crust and the, and the, the, the top of the bottom of the Earth's crust. That's the system that we need to be concerned with if we're concerned with our own life support system and what makes this such a remarkable planet for life, a, a, a real anomaly. We don't know how much we're an anomaly, but clearly a very, very special place and a place where life has profoundly reshaped the conditions for its own flourishing, uh, meaning life is principally responsible for cycling all the elements it needs to flourish, to build its bodies, if you like. And I did mention a couple of those as well. That's the relevant Earth system. And within that, we if we would probably define something we call the climate system, which would just be a way of referring to the bits that alter the long-term uh, mean temperature and conditions of the climate at the surface of the Earth. So, so that shifts the emphasis a little bit more, maybe to the uh, to the atmosphere, of the ocean, to particular elements like, and particular gases like carbon dioxide and methane as gases and their cycling, and maybe it places less emphasis on the cycling of another element like nitrogen uh, or phosphorus. For example, we don't think of phosphorus as being particularly heavily connected into the climate part of the system, although, as usual, there's always some connection. <laughs> so, yeah, the climate system is essentially a subsystem of the, the living Earth system. And within the climate system, we could then define some other subsystems of that, by which I mean um, an ice sheet like the one on Greenland or West Antarctica is a system in itself, and it's also a subsystem within the larger climate system because it's kind of affected by the climate and has some effect on the climate. So it's kind of Russian dolls of systems and subsystems. Yeah. And then you look at the circulation of these dolls and subdolls of how all of them interconnect um, and make one each other function. That's right. And it's like one of uh, philosophers have fancy words for it, ontology. But like when you're looking at the world, you could take a, an object or a thing view of the world and then you would label things like ice sheets or trees or an Amazon rainforest. Or you could take a process-based philosophy and you could say, well, actually, maybe the processes are the primary thing. Um, and maybe it's actually the cycles and the flavors of nitrogen or water that are more the, the, the primary thing we should focus on. Of course, there are both, and mostly in Western philosophy, we've opted for the, the thing approach, um, the, the object approach over the process 
philosophy, but the kind of science that I do speaks to certainly putting a bit more emphasis on a process-based uh, view of the world, because um, it's the processes that keep the world stable or propel the stability. And we are, of course, in a time of change. I think we can all agree on that. And change is, you know, a process. <laughs> so I, for those reasons, I, I have to weave both threads, um, the, you know, the object and the process view. Um, and it's just like you and I asking, you know, what does it mean to be alive? Well, that's really a process thing, isn't it? Um, because tragically, sometimes things die, but nothing has it apparently changed from one moment to the next, but everything has changed. So in an object sense, nothing has changed, and in a process change sense, something just changed profoundly. This is extremely interesting because, of course, you, you mentioned if it's a process, there are dynamics within the process. So you talk about stability, change, and of course, we're going to come later to tipping points. There is this notion of what is too much, what is too little, um, in terms of speed, in terms of magnitude, in terms of many different things. And of course, these are also the different vital signs. W what is a vital sign in these circulations? W what is the pulse that you're measuring? First things first, why do we care about um, cycles or what we might call the circular metabolism of the planet? Well, this is essential to our life support. So it's probably not widely known that um, if you take an essential element for life, like phosphorus, so this is an element that is essential to the molecules in us that carry energy. It's also essential to the nucleic acids that carry information. Take an element like phosphorus, and you look at um, the amount of phosphorus that comes into the Earth as a system, and the amount that might go out into rocks, if you like. So it might come in from volcanic processes and might go out in new rocks. It's tiny compared to the amount of phosphorus that's cycling round and round in ecosystems and in the whole biosphere, by which I mean any atom of phosphorus will go round and round your typical, say, forest ecosystem, maybe 40 or 50 times before it's lost. So what I'm saying is this that we only flourish on this planet because of the circular metabolism, because of life cycling everything it needs. So we've got to be concerned with that process if we've got any sense of um, self-preservation and survival. We also realise, oh, we've got this thing, the climate, and we appear to be knocking it out of whack, as my uh, late friend Bruno Latour put it. And that tells us that, hold on a minute, if we're knocking it out of whack, something was keeping it stable before, how does that happen? And that then speaks to a number of things. It speaks to what you mentioned, this word feedback, that sometimes in a complex system like the Earth or the climate, um, a change happens, but then within the system comes back a response that can sometimes damp the initial change and thus maintain stability. Um, occasionally things go the other way. You get a, you cause a change in the system, you get a response from within the system that amplifies the initial change. And then, well, that's the other sign or type of feedback that then can be, well, a problem if, if it's change that is being propelled away from what we like. So we certainly need to be concerned with that kind of cycle in the sense of a feedback loop. It's a cycle of causality. It's not necessarily a cycle of material stuff, uh, although often material stuff is involved. So yeah, we have to, the literal cycles of material elements like phosphorus, carbon, these things that we depend on. And then we have the causal cycles or the causal loops um, that can either stabilize or destabilize things that we've got to care about. And in that sense, when we when we're talking about the concept we introduced of planetary boundaries, we're trying to put a label on some of the big ticket things we've got to care about as our life support, like like temperature or the climate, ozone layer, water cycle, nutrient cycles biodiversity or nature or whatever you want to call it and planetary boundaries is just very crudely trying to summarize well if we push some of these aspects of our life support system too far or too hard it's going to be bad for us and there's some kind of 
point uh, beyond which it's really not sustainable to go. And that, that's what we were trying to get at in defining a planetary boundary. Um, and uh, that that would then loop us back around to these other to thinking about these other cycle things. That <laughs> yeah, let's talk more about that at some uh, as we go through. I think <laughs> yeah, I, I think what's fascinating is what you just mentioned. This point, this point that you know, if we push harder, then something either accelerates, decelerates, breaks, or something like that. And what is a good threshold? How do we identify it? How do we work with it? Exactly. And a, and a tipping point, my favourite sort of subject, is a particular kind of threshold, which is made very clear because it's the kind of threshold where you go past it and then you trigger such strong amplification within a system that change becomes self-propelling and you don't have to keep pushing it. The change just continues. So I, I often like to encourage people to think about leaning back on their chair because everybody knows you lean back to a certain point on your chair and you get to a point where a little nudge one way or the other is going to either take you off into a very different state, sprawled on your back on the floor, or t or tip you back upright. And yeah, that's one of those points where the tiny nudge one way or the other then suddenly gets amplified into two different, very, very different outcomes. Now, for some, although not all of the planetary boundaries we identified, I could use this understanding we have of tipping points to be able to ground that notion of a boundary because it be begins to become clear for example with the ozone hole that opened up or was first discovered when I was like a not quite a teenager in the 1980s um, that was a classic case where there was some of this amplifying stuff going on in the chemistry of how particular compounds that got into the stratosphere and then work their chemical magic or whatever you want to think of it on the surface of frozen ice particles of what are called polar stratospheric clouds high in the atmosphere would then we say catalyze the destruction of the ozone layer which and that word catalysis is that is talking about an amplifying process of de the ozone destruction So that was like a tipping point I'd grown up with uh, in a broader sense of the world and also one that defined a kind of clear boundary like we didn't, we don't want to know so oh, we were starting to see the nasty consequences that could have. That one's pretty clear. But as you said, we're not talking about a simple system like a chair. We're talking about this beautiful, complex, living earth and we don't pretend we understand it perfectly. So we're always talking probabilities because we'll never know perhaps have a perfect foresight of where the tipping points are but we don't have no we have some information which is good as well as <laughs> best so we're navigating without a perfect map but we don't have no map we have <laughs> we have a sort of map with some blurry bits you have some <laughs> points in the map but uh, you can see it clearly in between perhaps yeah exactly and it and that that's okay because some information is way better than none <laughs> In this tipping point element, you say that, you know, you wobble a bit and you can either come back to a sitting position or fall on your back, right? So here we have two stable states, let's say, which are well defined. Yeah. How does it work with the Earth system? What is the stable state or is it a past state? And when was it this past stable state? And where are we going in this hothouse Uh, earth state you know have we been in a tipping point for a long time or I, how does these dynamics work an easier i'm not sure it's a better entry point to take a step down from the global scale and look at what i call the tipping elements mm -hmm. like like i gave a label to the subsystems as the climate system or the earth system that could more clearly demonstrate These different stable states, like you mentioned in the introduction, the great overturning of circulation at the Atlantic Ocean or the Greenland Ice Sheet or the West Antarctic Ice Sheet or the Amazon Rainforest. Um, in each of those cases, we've got, well, various lines of evidence from Earth's past, from models and from kind of theory to, uh, to believe that they have different stable states that they can be tipped into and out of. So for each of those, we can then, well, we can look around the Earth as a system and try to identify all those systems that might be tipping elements. And then we can ask ourselves, 
what information do we have about how close um, they might be to a tipping point and could we force those systems past the tipping point and if we could what would the consequences be and how big an issue is that and should we do something about it and that's sort of the exercise I've been doing on and off for 20 years and trying to because and trying to alert people to the basic answers because even nearly 20 years ago when we were first looking at this it was obvious that there were there were several tipping elements several bits to the climate system that could could be tipped into another state and that we would really care about the consequences and in each case um, we know what's at the core of this it's that you can get to a point where within a system uh, you go from a situation where there were these damping feedbacks that maintain the status quo, like preserving the ice sheet on Greenland, but if you were forcing it to melt, you shifted the balance of feedback and you could trigger a self-propelling amplifying feedback. In that case, you get to a point where as the ice sheet surface drops in altitude, it moves into warmer air, which melts things further, and at some point, you get a tipping point where that becomes what we call runaway feedback. Well, we would I've been busy cataloguing all the bits of the planet for which, yeah, there was credible reason to think you had the alternative stable state that existed and you could reach this tipping point of um, self-propelling change. And the, the hard bit then is to try to work out how near that tipping point is. But we have ways of doing that imperfectly or getting a clue, getting a clue uh, that maybe we can talk about more, but in essence, if you think about the example of leaning back on the chair near the balance point, you know that when you're near the balance point, things are actually a bit more sluggish. There's sort of uh, there's things that move, the chair doesn't move around so fast near the balance point, uh, and there's a more general thing there that as a system approaches a tipping point, the things that gave it resilience—that's a popular word. The things that were the damping feedbacks that try to maintain the original state or status quo, they're getting weaker. And so the nearer you get to a tipping point, the more sluggish the system becomes because you hit it, but it can't recover. It wants to recover, but it can't recover as effectively. Um, and we look for that signal of slowing down and also increasing variability will go along with that in a system as a kind of clue a tipping point may be approaching um, and we can we try to do that as best we can across all these tipping elements. But you rightly asked, well, well, well how does that all add up? Because at some point, even if we try to be, uh, I might say, reductionist and, and identify these separate systems that could tip, we then um, quickly realise, well, they're coupled together. And actually, if you tip one thing, it can sometimes make tipping another more likely. So if things are wired up like that, you realise, oh, well, eventually the consequences of one tipping event, tipping another, tipping another, um, it become, they become very global and they have many ramifications. And that's where we can start to talk about, well, you mentioned a hot house earth. I, I actually think a wet house earth, if you can call it that, is, is, the, is the more worrying or the more likely kind of global tipping point because of rising waters and also rising sea level precisely yeah. that we could tip a kind of coupled loss of the ice sheets on both poles and it might unfold by human terms relatively slowly but quite irreversibly and lead into the wet house equally we could fundamentally reorganize the circulation of the ocean and thus the circulation of the atmosphere and the whole climate now, that does not have to necessarily translate into amplifying the global warming or the global temperature change. It would still be an absolute catastrophe because if, as has happened in Earth's past, if you reorganize the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean and you thus break the monsoon in West Africa and India and disrupt it in, in South America and, and all the other monsoons, well, given where people live and how many depend on the monsoons, we're all going to feel that as a catastrophe. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure which... For, that's not wet house. Uh, if I have to give that a good, a, a snappy name, I'll have to think of one. But it, it's kind of... Um, it's certainly catastrophe house, Earth. <laughs> Even if it isn't hot house, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, so perhaps uh, we can share... Uh, I think it's in, in your paper called uh, Climate Tipping Points. 
Um, you have listed nine of them. You have the um, uh, Amazon rainforest, the Arctic sea ice, the Atlantic circulation, boreal forest, coral reefs, Greenland ice sheet, permafrost, West Antarctic ice sheet, and Waukee's ba uh, Basin. So I think over there, what's important, you mentioned some impacts, what happens when we tip. You mentioned their link. So there is the domino effect or the cascade effect that one can tip to another. And you also mentioned the irreversibility. Some of these we might have already crossed and it's just these feedback loops that will make, for instance, the um, Arctic sea ice disappear, right? So some of them ha we have already crossed or wh what is the state uh, here? This is both the beauty of science and the thing that frustrates <laughs> not scientists, I think, that it's quite hard to be absolutely definitive. We're in one of those times of profound sort of uncertainty. We've got quite a lot of evidence that part of the West Antarctic ice sheet could now be an irreversible retreat. Um, it's some couple of major glaciers draining into the Amundsen Sea that drain a large chunk of the ice sheet, large meaning enough to raise the world's sea levels by over a metre. Um, we can't rule out that one's crossed. And we also think from our modelling that when you lose that part of the ice sheet, unfortunately that destabilises other parts of the ice sheet. So you might end up losing most of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which would be about three and a half metres of sea level rise in the long run. And then if we go around to Greenland, it's, we know that Greenland's losing ice at an accelerating rate. We're just not sure if it, it could lose again about a metre or so of sea level rise equivalent. And at that point, a lot of the bits of Greenland that are stuck in the ocean will have gone and you'll be left with the bits of Greenland that are on the land. Uh, and then we're not sure whether it will restabilise or whether it'll reach a further tipping point where um, it, basically the amount of snowfall is not enough each year to balance the amount of melt. Uh, and, then that, and then it is definitely committed the whole thing to go. And if the whole thing is on the way out, it's another seven metres of sea level rise. So it's hard to rule out that we, we can't be sure either way, but it's, hard, but it's certainly hard to rule out that we might have committed to like 10 metre higher sea level in the long run. The long run means, it could mean thousands of years or it could go quicker if we keep warming things up. But 10 metres of sea level means if it's already baked in, which we're not sure, it means at some point London, Shanghai, Amsterdam, New York, Boston, San Francisco, a bunch of cities um, are going to have to, well, they won't be where they are now. <laughs> Yeah, in the long run. And and you think, well, a oh, thousand years doesn't matter or whatever your ethical position is. But I live in Exeter. It's a Roman city. It's been here the best part of 2,000 years. London's the same. So actually, even when I started writing about this 15 years ago, I tried to say that, look, I'll be clear about my ethical time horizon. And I, I am going to care about things that, could unfold even on a thousand year time scale um, because many of us would identify something about our society that goes back, you know, thousands of years. So why not think about commitments we're making a thousand years hence? I think over here we have a very interesting point because the irreversibility, I think many of us do not fully understand what does that mean. We often are very good with linear systems and linear responses, but very bad with exponentials, nonlinear responses and all of that. And that also means that once we go, once we have tipped, we will not see again this, uh, you know, these beautiful um, landscapes, but also these elements that keep us alive <laughs> in a certain sense. So the 1.5 degrees, not just, oh, well, we missed it, we're going to do better next year. Yes, the worst kind of irreversibility is is death, or even maybe worse than that, is the extinction of a species, for example. You're never going to get it back. Um, but we're talking about, yes, as you put it, like 
mentally keying into that concept that you can make, we can collectively make commitments to lose things. And even if they haven't gone yet, we're not going to be able to stop them going. So I suppose you could think of it as having this macabre power of being able to um, collectively create a kind of death for some things that like, we think are quite normal and might, when we thought about it, cherish or might want to preserve. Like, it's the death won't come immediately, certainly not from the sea level rise, but it's still, I find it like a moral proposition to consider us collectively committing, well, even the death of London now I think of it, but certainly the death of the, a major ice sheet. I'm not saying that ice sheet has always been there for all time. Of course it hasn't, but it's been there for all the time humans have been here, that's for sure. <laughs> certainly in the case of the ones we've talked about. Um, and when you go to talk to about other species or things like the Amazon rainforest, they've been here a, a lot longer than we have. Um, and so it is something we really haven't got our brains around in a kind of collective cultural sense. But this is arguably because we are looking at the world with through the wrong eyes or with the wrong worldview anyway, because we've grown up, or not as the case may be, in a culture that for 400 years or so has been telling itself that the world and the universe is a big clockwork machine where like, the response you get is kind of proportional to the input you give it. <laughs> and we, that, I believe, is basically a delusion. But, um, you know, if we continue to teach our kids that um, and we continue to adopt an economic framework that, that is sort of can, strongly believes in or is connected to that, then, um, well, then it's going to take a bit of snapping out of that uh, delusion. But the, unfortunately, we're all snap out of the delusion if we start to see more of the kind of uh, off the scale ex extremes of the climate that we witnessed in 2023 everybody starts waking up and realizing that hold on the output doesn't seem to be proportional to the input here yeah. what's going on but <laughs> yeah and i think it's very interesting because over here you very much have this ontological versus processed approach right the uh, the, the tipping mm -hmm. points are an ontology or are an object by themselves, but also are part of this circulation, humans as well. So, yeah, it's it's very interesting that you introduced that before. Yeah, I like the way you asked the question originally. And I sometimes think, yeah, there must have been something you might call a tipping point, perhaps an evolutionary tipping point in the human coupled to the Earth sort of story. It's hard to put your finger on it, but at which oh gosh, we entered the what's called the Anthropocene and we or we entered the Great Acceleration and we went into this mode of what really appears to be driving it, possibly its own destruction. I think the most compelling case um, is to be made for the switch into the kind of persistent economic growth, which some people is, obviously would celebrate, some of us would have reservations about, and that only really comes with the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that, there really was a strong damping feedback that you might get a little bit richer, but then you tended to have or have a bit more food production, but then you tended to have more kids and you would just dilute the gains among more people and that damp, damp the thing down again. The crux of what the most fundamental change that probably ties back to the origins of capitalism um, and extractivism and all of its sins is the point at which um, you switch into a long-run growth regime because as people get richer, instead of thinking I'll have more kids, they think, no, I'll have fewer and I'll educate them more. And and then you get into this, essentially you get the beginnings of what has been for, a, what is it now, uh, a century and a half or so, um, if, uh, uh, some called long-run economic growth, but at great, es uh, continuing to accelerate, escalating um cost on our life support system and everybody knows when they scratch their head hard enough that that just can't continue you can't you, as people have said for decades sensible people have said for decades you cannot continue to grow indefinitely on a finite planet yeah as kenneth balding was saying you you need to be either a madman or an economist to, to believe that <laughs> exactly um 
And he said that in what was it, 1970? Yeah, 60s or something like that, yeah. Um, So before we switch gear to even more complex elements, which would be like socio-ecological systems, um, there is this one last piece that I would like to introduce, which are early warning signals. Um, Where do these fit in in this whole tipping point? When a system reaches a tipping point, um, as it approaches, what you're seeing is the damping feedbacks that maintain the old status quo are getting weaker, and then some amplifying feedbacks that are about to really take over and propel change are getting stronger. So it's like a tug of war or something. Now, that's going to give telltale signs because in a complex world, systems are getting kind of nudged all the time by uh, little changes. And then you can watch how a system responds. And as you approach the tipping point, a system gets less and less good at recovering from the little shocks it might get from the world uh, because the damping feedbacks that want to maintain the status quo are losing their power. And so that manifests as, ah, I nudged the system and now it moves further than it did and it struggles to come back. So it slows down in a literal sense of, of recovery, but the variability or variance in the system goes up. So we expect to see this coupled change in statistical terms, increase in the variance, um, but coupled with something we technically talk about as correlation in time or autocorrelation. But it's really just saying if a system is slowing down, then at one point in time, like today is more like yesterday, then tomorrow will be more like today as the system slows down. And we can statistically measure that. So we look for those coupled signals as a clue that our damping feedback or resilience in our system is getting weaker. Uh, That's not a cast iron guarantee that we're about to hit a tipping point. What we should do as scientists is have other additional reasons to be thinking the system we're looking at could tip. And that evidence can be because it has in the past, for example. Um, Now, then what we once we've got those ingredients, we think, okay, yeah, this is a system could tip. We can look, we look in the data essentially for that. It's technically called critical slowing down behavior. We look for those statistical signals. And of late, um, other groups have been getting stuck into this as well. We've begun to get confident enough in the method and have enough data to be able to see that we can look at, say, the Amazon rainforest from space, from, from, satellites from the actually including from the international space station and we're looking at things like the fluctuation of the moisture content of the forest which kind of if it's if it if the mass of the biomass of the forest fluctuates the moisture content fluctuates as well we can look at something like that and we can see oh no those fluctuations are slowing down over the last 20 years doesn't mean we're right at a tipping point but it means the system is losing resilience that's that's a worry um and that's just one of many examples where we start to see this is possible and it gives us extra information about what's going on and where where I suppose to raise the alarm bells. Yeah, so more points in, in your map, I guess, to, to read your direction. So I'd like to pick your brain about socio-ecological systems um, and how can we apply tipping points within these? Because as if uh, ecological systems were easy enough and uh, not complex enough. If you add a strata, uh, a layer of humans that are completely non-logical human beings and organize into societies and interact with these ecological systems, you know, there, there is uh, this famous uh, element that says that uh, there are some social tipping points if more than 25% of population adopt a certain behavior, then we, we have this cultural tipping point. How do you approach, you know, territorial or socio-ecological systems uh, with this, uh, with the glasses that you already have? I tend to, first of all, look at it through the feedback glasses, because I know at some deep level, and you could say it's a mathematical level, and in this case, you're going to have to buy into the view that there are some sort of laws of nature, essentially. And all of us as scientists have kind of signed up to that. <laughs> but I would go to the social, the messy social ecological systems through the same lens as a feedback and say, do we have, can we have, or do we have a situation where 
the balance of feedback in this now even more complex system with the people in it could shift and the amplifying of feedback that can exist in these systems can it get to a point where it's strong enough where it becomes self-propelling which is by my definition a tipping point how do i go about that well i would look i would do the same i do for the planet or the climate you look into history and you say oh yeah there are some apparent tipping points here there are these political process that turn into a violent or a non-violent revolution, which then fundamentally change the trajectory of a nation. Um, or, oh, we went we went from horse-drawn carriages to cars in a decade in US cities at the start of the 20th century, or a bunch of other um, examples. And then, I, then you ask yourself, or I ask myself, okay, this is interesting. What are the reinforcing feedbacks that can bring that, that are behind these tipping point changes? Well, protests and political revolutions are a classic example. The first person to protest is very brave. They're they're putting their life on the line sometimes, aren't they? But they crucially, by changing what's called their publicly stated preference, they're making it incrementally easier for the next person to break from social norms, as they're called, and and join them in the protest who makes it incrementally easier for the next one and so on. And sometimes that reinforcing feedback can get it can get strong enough to cause exponential growth, self-propelling change, as we all saw with the climate protest movement and as we've all seen in history with other examples. And then that, then you discover, oh, well, that's just one case of uh, sort of social contagion dynamics that can apply to other things, like a bank run, as they're famously called, when... You know, so as soon as some people start thinking, oh, I'm not sure the bank's a safe place for my money, I better queue up and get my money out. Other people start going, oh my God, they're worried about the bank being solvent. They're taking their money out. I'd better go and take my money out. And then that, and so on. Right, so it's obvious that those ones are, are tipping points and strong reinforcing feedback. Technology is really interesting in our relationship with it, but it's not hard to dig around and learn a bit about those fields and realize, oh yeah, actually the people who are specialists on what's called diffusion of innovation have been saying for over 60, 70 years that, hey, there's a common pattern here that new innovations suddenly, suddenly take off exponentially in their uptake. And that there's a bunch of stuff usually going on there. It's partly because people sometimes are imitating what other people do and taking up a, in this case, a technology or a behavior. Um, so that's very pure social contagion that gets called. But also, the more we make something, if it's a if it's a technology, the better we get at making it. So the more attractive it becomes to us to to adopt it. But also, the more we make something, usually the cheaper it gets to make. Economies of scale, we call it, and that's a reinforcing feedback as well. Now, all these reinforcing feedbacks sometimes go in the melting pot together to together become strong enough to give you the tipping point, like like horse-drawn carriages to cars or something like that. but Or or, or at the moment, it's like uh, petrol diesel cars to electric cars. So these are some of the positive tipping points that you call them? Yeah, so then my basic uh, argument is, well, look at the evidence that we're crossing, we're starting to cross the bad climate tipping points and risking domino effects and things that are real genuine existential risk and we've left it too late to just incrementally try to tackle climate change and stop all fossil fuel burning and greenhouse gas emissions that's not going to cut it um so we're not going fast enough we're doing something to to try to act on climate change but we're going about i reckon by my latest estimate somewhere between seven and ten times too slowly at decarbonizing the economy so we've got to f- b- f- believe we can find some pretty strong amplifying feedback so they're going to amplify the change we need to technology and behavior change to get to to basically stop emitting greenhouse gases. And, and that means finding and triggering what I call positive tipping points positive because in the, in the normative sense, uh, it's a very positive thing to avoid what will other be, otherwise be by my own calculations the harm to billions of people um later this century so positive in that sense accepting that every 
tipping point of behavioural and technological change will always run to possibilities of losers as well as winners, um, beneficiaries as well as those who will feel like they suffer from the change. And where where um, disbenefit or suffering from change intersects with people who are already suffering or less well off, then there's a political need to spot those cases and, um, well, essentially uh, provide what are called social safety nets or support for those who might be disbenefited for something that's for the that we can all agree has to be for the collective good to avoid the extraordinary kind of harms that are gonna that are escalating from the climate change. And so these uh, positive tipping points, I think you have identified a couple of them. You you mentioned the electrification of vehicles. I did. I mentioned electric vehicles because we you just look at the data from Norway in ten years. The markets tipped from to ninety percent electric vehicle sales in twenty twenty three, um, and globally, I w I would argue, and my group's analysis would suggest we're very close to, if not past, a kind of global market tipping point. But we could probably think of it market by market. So a lot of Europe is already, I think, past the tipping point to electric vehicles. The Chinese market has the U.S. market's a couple of years behind. But the point is. The more electric vehicles and the more, crucially, the more batteries for electric vehicles that get made, the cheaper the next battery has got, gets to make, and also the, bet, the better the next battery and the EV gets. And we're near that cost parity tipping point. We're already at the tipping point that the total cost of ownership of an electric vehicle is cheaper than or competitive with a petrol or diesel car in many markets. And we're even getting to the point where the purchase price is the same, knowing that they're cheaper to run. Electricity is way cheaper than um, than petrol or diesel. So that one's underway, and it's not a perfect technology, the new technology, but for sure it's way better than the one it's replacing. Um, and then the other really big one is the power sector. It's electricity generation. It's the tipping point from fossil fuel power electricity to renewable power um we're really you know i'm sat in the uk where we in the last 10 years of or well, since 2012 we went from 40 percent of our power from coal burning to pretty much zero there's one coal burning power station left in the uk and it's closing in september this year so in less than nine months time um and all that 40 percent and a little bit more has been taken over by renewables and as hopefully listeners will already know, there's exponential growth of um, solar power and wind power worldwide. And solar power is, they're both coming down in price all the time, the more they're deployed, but solar power is coming down in price the fastest. And for that reason, my uh, colleague Femke Nysa here is predicting robustly that you know, maybe we're already past the tipping point in the, for solar power to have the potential to dominate even by 2050. Um, there's a number of conditions that need to be met for that to happen, and it could go faster. But we're already, in a sense, at the point where, yeah, those reinforcing feedbacks, the more panels I deploy, the cheaper the next panel gets, um, are so strong that 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 they're beginning to rule the the day or rule the dynamics. And even if you, for whatever political reasons, think you want to try and preserve the coal burning or the coal mining industry somewhere, um, you might find yourself faced with, um, in this case, you could call them economic forces that are so strong, um, you won't be able to. <laughs> yeah, you know. I'd like to summarize perhaps our discussion about these tipping points, right? I, I think for the listener or the viewer, they really need to take home perhaps a message about this dynamic component. Is it going from one state to another? What, what is something that after 20 years or so still surprises you or whenever you say to someone, you, you feel like this is still uh, blowing your mind, you know, about these tipping points are, are so essential in our everyday life or in our everyday understanding? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of pinch myself sometimes when I wake up and realize, oh my word, we, we, we're we right on potentially on the cusp of five 
big tipping points in the climate to commit ourselves to irreversible and damaging changes like the loss of major ice sheets and loss of carbon, frozen soils, and so forth. Yet, at the same time, I pinch myself because we have one get-out-of-jail card left, and that is the evidence that we're also seeing this self-propelling tipping point change happening in our social world and our technological world um, with a much faster than expected exponential growth of some things, things being crucial things like a renewable power supply, electrification of the activities around us, and also arguably of some social and political changes, although it always seems frustrating. It always seems like, why hasn't that happened? Why hasn't that happened? But there's a lot of evidence that it is starting to happen, and that's what keeps me sane, the knowledge that maybe the t- positive tipping points can win, can win the race against the, the negative climate tipping points. What an existential and nail-biting match over here. Um, <laughs> perhaps, can, could you recommend us with a movie or a book that you would like to recommend for people to inspire themselves or continue the discussion? Of course, you, you had the discussion that inspired you to become a researcher. Yeah, I would have to say, if you've never read it, you have to read um, James E. Lovelock, Gaia, and you look at life on Earth. Um, 1979 I think he first published it that book changed my life so did the next book he wrote um, The Ages of Gaia a biography of our living earth in fact the second one is for me better than the first Um, they changed my life so they might change yours if you've not read them well fantastic there you go everyone you have uh, more to to read and to understand after that many thanks team for for our discussion it was lovely thanks Aristide 